And as, as you know, uh, there are um, uh, several different kinds of interactions that can occur with particles. Uh, I mean, the main two that we think about are collisions and fo outside forces. Uh, so I'm, and, and the third one, a third very important thing which we know much less about is boundary effects. Uh, I'm talking about the, the, the second one, namely the effects of force, electromagnetic forces acting on the plasma. So, so and I will find a collisionless means that, um, that the collisions are relatively infrequent relative to the, to, to the time scale in which you're, in which you're looking at. So um, let's see. Let's see. This is supposed to perhaps. Uh, so. Okay. Anyway, but um, uh, so so exam exam there. Uh, Collisionless, oh yeah, you got it, you got it going. Is it that somewhere? Is it that response? I use the keyboard. Yeah. Is it that keyboard? So, okay, I can use the keyboard if necessary. Okay, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, first, yeah, so what I want you to say, I'll talk about this in a moment, uh, that, um, um, no, I lost my train of thought. Uh, let me, let me go on to the next one here. Okay. It works now? Okay, good. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so um, the kind of applications in which, for a plasma in which you, you will see uh, collisionless, this kind of situation, is a uh, lot of applications in astrophysics. Many applications. And the reason is basically the particles like in, in the solar wind, for example, the particles are, it's very uh, sparse, the particles are very far apart. So collisions don't happen very often, but they produce a, a significant amount of, of um, electromagnetic forces. And in a nuclear reactor, when it's hot, when it's very hot, the, of course, there are many collisions, but you're really interested in what happens in a, in a very short time scale. And, and the uh, kinetic energy is, is uh, dominating over the collisions in those short time scales. Uh, okay, so, um, so yeah, this is what I'm saying here. And so what I'm going to talk about today is mainly, I'm gonna talk about work of Young Guo and Young Guo with myself over in, in mostly in the 1990s and also work that I've been doing with Zhi Wu Lin uh, somewhat more recently uh, on, on the question of stability of equilibria. Uh, so let me go back to the previous, yeah, there were previous, this is just a little introduction to what I mean by stability. So for the kind of model I'm talking about, you have no dissipation at all in the problem. Energy is conserved and entropy, the analog of entropy is conserved uh, in this model. So th there's nothing dissipating like there is in the Boltzmann equation. So what that implies is that there are many, many equilibria. And you want to study which of these equilibria are stable and which are unstable and how they are unstable. So I'm just, so I'm just here I'm indicating uh, Suppose you just, in general, suppose you just have some PDE of this type, uh, some nonlinear PDE, and you have an equilibrium up there. And then, um, <coughs> uh, and then what I mean by stable means that if you start with initial, so equilibrium is F with a superscript zero, and this means time zero. So if you start very close to equilibrium, 
if that implies that for all time, all the way to infinity, it remains close, uh, then that's, that's what stability means, meaning if there's an epsilon, there's a delta. For every epsilon, there's a delta. Uh, and usually you study this by linearizing. So you linearize that equation at the very top, and you get this. I'm using g for the linearized guy. And this is a linear equation with a coefficient here. And you look at whether the solution to that of growing exponentially or decaying exponentially or maybe constant. Uh, so you look at what lambda is when you have non-trivial solutions of this problem. So that becomes a question about the spectrum of this operator. And you want to know whether lambda, whether the real part of lambda is positive or, or not. And you call it, and we say that we have a growing mode for this stability problem. If, if you're in the right half plane, it means it's growing. So it's growing exponentially even. So that's a growing mode. And then, uh, well, for the purpose of this lecture, linear stable. Linearly stable means there are no growing modes. There's no lambda in this half plane. Uh, that means you could still have some modes, some solutions which grow maybe polynomially, for example. That's permitted by my definition. But, so there are some other definitions. Sometimes this is called spectral stability. <coughs> but I want to emphasize a problem. In this problem that we're talking about, um, you have no decay built into the problem. Nothing is decaying. You don't have that entropy like in the Boltzmann equation. And so stability will mean sort of, none of, none of these guys, none of these guys, but it will mean that whenever you look at the, um, at solutions of this type, the lambdas are all purely imaginary. OK, so that's just an introduction to what I mean by stability. OK. so. So let me just write down the model, the model. Here, here's the, the model, the equations we're talking about, the system. So you start by just thinking of a part, one particle, one particle in an electromagnetic field. So this is the force, whoops, too fast. This is the force up here. That's the force, the electromagnetic, standard electromagnetic force. This is just a particle moving with that force. And uh, let's see, I'm, I'm making it a little bit I, uh, I'm using a special relativity here uh, to um, uh, in this model. So by v, I don't mean the velocity vector, but I mean the momentum vector. And and I put all constants equal one. So in particular, the speed of light is one. So just remember, the speed of light is one, but it's huge, right? Um, anyway, so when you make that normalization then the energy just, and I took the mass equal to one, the, the charge of a particle equal to plus or minus one. Uh, so then this is the energy. And this quotient is the velocity. And you see this quotient, the bracket V is given over there. This quotient is less than one, which means it's less than the speed of light. Uh, OK, so that's, that's the velocity appears up there at the top and over there. And so here's the loss of equation. So now when you consider a density of a lot of particles, then you model it by a continuous density. And then you just get this equation where the characteristics of this first order PDE, the characteristics are given by those, P, those ODEs up on the top. And these, two, these equations are just Maxwell's equations, exactly. Pure Maxwell equations where you just add up all the charges and all the, and the current. And see, here's the velocity here. And I have two kinds of particles, which I'm modeling here, right? ion electron. And so one has a plus sign, one has a minus. OK, so that's this. Everything I'm talking about is about this system. And now we, we're going to take some equilibrium for this. Oh, before I do that, I just want to mention briefly that you have a constant energy. That's the, that's the energy. That's the electric and magnetic field E and B. And that's the kinetic energy of the first integral there. And uh, so that opposedness, well, 
what was in this in several two and a half dimensions, which I won't get into, was proven in the a series of really terrific papers by Bob Glassy over there and Jack Schaefer. And uh, I'm not going to talk more about that question. Um, and um, OK, then I'm, I will often be talking about the use of the electric and magnetic potentials. This is pure electromagnetic theory. You just, you just take the uh, magnetic and electric potentials. You can write it this way using Maxwell's equations. And all of Maxwell's equations reduced to this, to this line over here, <coughs> which you see is hyperbolic, more, well, more or less hyperbolic here and elliptic over there. <coughs> OK, so you've got, you've got your A is a vector, B is a scalar. OK, so yeah, as I said, there are lots of equilibrium. <coughs> um, but there, is a very simple class of equilibrium. But the mu's are anything. Well, that's very probable density because it will have to be big or equal to zero. But, but this is already a very rich class of equilibrium for any, any function, essentially any function to use. With, that's the equilibrium with not depending on time. And there have been a number of studies of their stability, but the first one and very famous one is by Oliver Penrose in 1960, and then uh, a number of other people, and Jan and I worked on this question. Uh, and then, then there was another set of equilibria called BGK, BGK equilibria, which are of this form. So you have some any function of this quantity. This is the electric particle density here. And the electric field is not zero. And oh, the, the magnetic field here equals zero. And the electric field is of this form. And this is just the potential. And then you put it in here. And those are all, all those are equilibrium. And the question is, which ones of those are stable? So again, remember that the mu minus is any function, non-negative. And the phi has to the phi now has to satisfy an equation which I'll write down shortly. Okay, and you can have more general things which have a magnetic field in the same way. <coughs> um, I'll skip that. Okay, so here's an example of um, the results I want to talk about, which is just just a very very particular example where we can prove everything we really want to prove here. So I take a very simple case here. I have here a very simple case. This is a, what I call a magnetic equilibrium. So in the equilibrium, I, I have no electric field in this example, but the magnetic field oscillates exactly periodically with period 2 pi. And epsilon is a small parameter. And then the uh, particle density over here, whoops, oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. OK, uh, the particle density. Is, is this, so you can just check, you can check easily that this will satisfy exactly, is an equilibrium, satisfy all the conditions, and I put in here an exponential, it makes it a lot simpler. This is an exponential in the particle en uh, kinetic energy, and then you have another term here, which, okay, this is in the, okay, this is in the so-called one and a half dimensional mo uh, special case where x, x is only one dimensional and the velocity is two dimensional. <coughs> oh, and this is um, the third component, the three x, y, z, it's the z component of the magnetic field. Okay, so what we can prove by the theorems that I'm going to state in a moment are that this equilibrium is stable under perturbations of period 2 pi but unstable in general, in general under some perturbations of period 4 pi. So period, per, per, so you take some equilibrium, now you take the initial condition, which is a little bit, which is close to this. This is, a, epsilon is fixed here, but it's going to be small. But close to this guy. And, uh, okay, and then, and then the, the question is whether you get growth or not basically, uh, in growth in time. And if you, if you 
if you take the same period as what we started with up there, then you do not get growth in time. It's really stable. And if you take perturbations, so now you take the initial conditions are not don't have period two pi, but a period four pi. It's a more general class. It can allow extra oscillations. And it's unstable under certain kinds of such perturbations. So that's an example. That's a concrete example of rather general theorems I'm going to state in a moment. OK. So see, I'm going to state some theorems in cylindrical symmetric case. So now I'm in three dimensions, cylindrical symmetry. So you have to bear with me with this notation. So it's the standard. Uh, standard cylindrical R theta Z is norm, the usual <coughs> coordinates. Uh, and so R is a two-dimensional radius of, in X and Y variables. And now here's, now we consider an equilibrium. This is a very general equilibrium. So, so it's going to be, uh, the electric field is like this. It's a gradient. That's, that come, it has to be that way from Maxwell's equations. And then the field has this form. So in cylindrical symmetry, this is this is the kind of equilibrium you get. So oh, so this notation. So these, like this is the unit vector in the r direction. This is the unit vector in the z direction, and so on. And where but cylindrical symmetry means that every all the functions are independent of the angle going this way. And then there are components in that direction. But no, none of the functions depend on theta. So when I write, oh, so when I write A theta like this thing right here, what do I mean? I mean I take the magnetic vector potential A, I take its theta component, and this is in equilibrium. This is the equilibrium, the superscript zero means equilibrium. Okay, so uh, okay, so that's the equilibrium I'm gonna talk about, and then the, and then, um, okay, so there are two important invariants of the, you can think of these as invariants of the ODEs that I wrote at the very beginning of my lecture. Uh, this is the, the kinetic energy and this is uh, a component of the particle and an angular momentum. Uh, involves the function phi naught and maybe the, there's an external field and also the theta component of just the theta component. The other components don't appear right here. Okay. So these are preserved along these quantities are preserved along the particle paths. And okay, so yeah, given given this E and this, I'm going to use this notation E and P here. I'm going to look at functions of little e and little p. Oh, so this so for the equilibrium. This is going to be the form of the electromagnetic field in the equilibrium, but I have to tell you the particle density. The particle density is a function of, this e, of these two invariants, E and P. And then if you stick that, just because it's of this form, it automatically satisfies Wasserhaus equation. But you still have to satisfy Maxwell equations, which take this form these two equations right here. And that's just an elliptic system with two functions, two scalar functions here. Phi naught is a scalar function. A theta naught is a scalar function. And mu, see, depends on E and P. And E and P are these things that, you see, depend on, on the variables x and v appearing here. OK. Uh, so altogether, F naught, this equilibrium particle density, depends on the space and momentum. And if you solve this guy, there are many, many solutions of this. Many, many solutions of this. So you, once you solve it, you, you have equilibrium. And now you have many, many solutions. So it's not only that mu is general, but also you have a lot of solutions of this guy, of this elliptic system. So the question is, which are stable, which are unstable? So I'm not talking here about boundaries. So we're going to be in all sp either on the whole line or in all space R3. But we're going to have cylindrical symmetry in this. In this. So here's the statement of uh, the main theorem, uh, which 
because a necessary and sufficient condition, it's just for stability in the sense that I mentioned before. So stability by stability in this rather weak sense. Just is there a growing motor or not? Linear stability in this weak sense. Is there a growing motor? Is, is there one that e to the lambda t, well, lambda, which grows exponentially? So what the conclusion is, is that under some conditions that I stated above, um, there is, we have linear stability here if and only if some operator is non-negative. Now, of course, that's usually what you expect, but the point is that this operator L0, which I'll explain to you in a moment, what, what L0 is, is it's complicated, but it's not nearly as complicated as the original problem. It's, it's much reduced. Okay, so what are the assumptions? The assumptions are uh, that, um, that, well, this just says the number, the density is non-negative, uh, and this density is non-negative. So this is for the e assumptions on the equilibrium. So F naught, which is a function of, which is mu of those invariants, uh, has compact support in space momentum, in phase space, xv, and, uh, and this condition, which says that the number of particles of higher energy as you increase the energy, the number of particles is fewer. Uh, and, and then the perturbations are axisymmetric, cylindrically symmetric perturbations. That's all we can handle. <coughs> and then there is this operator L0, which I got on the next slide. So, uh, okay, so, um, this I think I explained. The point, the main point is that L0, while it's a little somewhat complicated, it only acts on scalar functions. So it just acts on L, it's a, it's a self-adjoint operator on L2. This guy is L2 of, of uh, on L2 of x, of the x variable. x is an R3 and you assume cylindrical symmetry. While the original, See, if you take the whole problem, it has all these components. Okay. And one of the things we can prove is that if there's a growing mode, lambda is real. It's like e to the lambda t, where lambda is real for a growing mode. And I'll skip the rest. So here's our mod. That's not that simple, but remember, only acts on scalar functions. So it's, it's the sum of two operators. It's the sum of that operator and that operator. Well, it looks pretty horrible, but okay. So there are three operators involved here. A2, 0, A1, 0. Well, let's drop this up. A2, A1, and these are by the script letters. It's, these are, I use script letters for operators. So, and then this B0 operator. That's the adjoint. Okay, so there are three operators. So look at A, A, look for example at A2 here. That's one of the terms. That's this line. Okay, so what is it? It's just a Laplacian. And then you have this function and this function. This is just a multi multiplication. You just multiply. Multiplication, multiplication. So this part, neglecting this integral term, is just a Schrodinger operator. This is a Schrodinger operator, and then we have this other term. So the other term, well, the other term acts on this function h. h is a function of x. And then, see, that brings in the momentum variable here. And then there's a projection, which I will describe on the next slide. OK, so it's a little bit, this is a non-local perturbation of a Schrodinger operator on L2. And this is the same kind of operator as that one. It's still, it's even simpler, a little bit simpler. Uh, it's just a Schrodinger operator, and then this is a non-local perturbation, and here we have a multiplication operator and a perturbation of that. Okay, so that, okay, so let me tell you what the projection is. So remember, if we go back to the Vlasov equation, this is the generator. When we realize, then this is the generator of, um, yeah, you linearize the Vlasov equation. 
and then you've got coefficients, and this is just the generator. In other words, the linearized Wasserhoff equation is just d the f dt equals df. Oh, I didn't write that down here. Yeah. The f dt with df is the linearized equation. So d is just an abbreviation for the linearized generator. And the short story is that p is the projection of L2 as a weight function here, of, L, of an L2 space onto the null space of d. So d acts on functions above x here, derivative with respect to x. And there are derivatives with respect to v. So it's a first order operator in x and v. It acts on L2 functions of x and v. And this is just a weight function, which this is a weight function to handle the momentum variable, as we often see in kinetic theory. You need some, to, some decay in the, in the v variable. Um, and uh, it's the projection onto that null space. Um, so, yeah, I have a little more explanation, but I think I'll skip that. The details. Oh, so let me, uh, okay, so that's the first theorem. And I'm going to skip the proof for the time being. I want to, I want to state some more theorems. I want to make sure I state the theorems before I, before I go into any proofs. Yeah. Okay, so now, okay, so this is, this is okay, but there are, two issues, there are two really important issues. One is can we verify under what conditions that operator is not negative in the main theorem? That's not so easy. Uh, and another question is, okay, we have linear stability, but do we have, do we, does that mean anything about the actual dynamics, the nonlinear dynamics of the problem. Um, and so I mean, this is related to the second question. What are the real dynamics, the actual dynamics of the problem? So this is what I call nonlinear theorem. So take the actual, the real problem, and we ask whether it's stable or not. Not linearly stable, but actually nonlinear non stable or not. So another problem is, to do that in more than this law, I only, we can only do that in this low dimensional case. Um, it's completely, I mean, in the general axisymmetric, in the axisymmetric case, which I talked about before, that's a really open problem. It would be a great problem if someone has ideas how to do it. Um, it's definitely not easy. So what we can do, uh, is is um, prove uh, is prove prove nonlinear stability or instability under some conditions at least in this much lower dimensional case. So this is the so-called one and a half dimensional case. So x is only one one dimension. V is only two dimensions. The and electric field is two dimensions and the Magnetic field is like that, right? So it's a much lower dimension. But that's perfectly consistent. Everything's fine. This is uh, a perfectly good system. Uh, OK, and now it's a, I'll state something somewhat different for, for simplicity. Maybe it helps the proofs. <laughs> but um, well, mostly for simplicity. Um, so I'm going to take a somewhat different setup. I'm going to assume periodicity. See, we have a Lemax variable. So I'm going to assume periodicity of some given period P. So now we have an equilibrium which has period P in the one in the x variable. And I'm also going to oh, this is a special, a spe, quite a special case. So I'm going to assume there's no electric field in the equilibrium. The, the, the perturbations will have an electric field in them. OK. And, and there is, however, a magnetic field in the equilibrium of this form. X is only one dimensional here. And uh, E now reduces to this. And little p reduces now. I took, in this model, I'm taking two particles. But that's not a big difference. 
here. I, I'm taking the two vital case with the ions and electrons. Okay, so I have a plus and a minus case here for ions and electrons. And I'm assuming this as usual. I'm assuming this as I did in the previous thing. And I'm assuming mu, this mu here, this mu is even in P plus and minus. And more generally, I could consider a mu plus and a mu minus, but I'm taking just one mu, the same one, and some decay. OK, assume that. Uh, so it's a little different from the previous, but basically the same kind of linear theorem occurs with just minor changes. <coughs> and so, so here's, here's the statement, a real statement of instability. So we take, consider the full nonlinear problem under these symmetry assumptions. <coughs> and so the first assumption is we, to prove nonlinear, I first assume this condition. This is the this is equivalent, according to theorem one, to, to the to the linear instability. So there's a growing mode. There must be a growing mode, according to the previous theorem. And then we prove that if the initial condition is close to the equilibrium, in some norm here, like here, close to equilibrium, I'll get to that in a moment. It was close enough. Then, oh, no matter, sorry, no matter how close it is, delta is arbitrary. So no matter how close it is, uh, the, the distance, let's look at this term, the distance between, at, time, at a much later time, much later time, uh, the distance between the magnetic field at time t and the, what it started out at time zero, it remains big. Now, what I have here is translations in the x variables, which you have to put in to make it reasonable. So this is a kind of orbital instability. Uh, and, uh, and here I have the electric field. But remember, under my assumption that I made, the electric field has no, uh, the, in the equilibrium, there's no electric field. So I don't have to subtract anything off of here. OK, and then, and then it says that this remains away from 0. So epsilon naught is fixed. So you, can't, you cannot say that it's less than any epsilon. It always stays bigger than epsilon naught. So that's really instability. And uh, the instability occurs within so the instability is like, it's like exponential instability. This logarithm delta means that the instability occurs within exponential time, um, within a certain time. But you could put, you could put infinity here. It would be OK to it. Uh, that's still a statement of instability. Now, what I want to point out is, OK, I want to point out this. Uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, the conclusion is that the, the electromagnetic field remains a wave, is unstable, not just the particle. So I don't have f, I don't have f of t minus f zero here. It just this is a microscopic field, which is uh, becoming unstable, which is growing, and. Um, on the other hand, from the initial conditions, we have very strong norm here. Whoop. Wrong one. OK. Uh, we have a very strong norm here, W11. I mean, it's much stronger than L1, obviously. It has a derivative. And it has also, we assume that initially it's close in, in all the, in a very strong sense here. <coughs> so uh, this is a kind of. That's why I call this a macroscopic instability, because you only have the macroscopic things in here. Um, so maybe I'll go on to the next, the final. Oh, well, one more thing. Here, OK. So I'm going to compare that with the a stability theorem. So we have a lot of trouble proving it without making special assumptions, although this absolutely can be generalized, but uh, it's not so simple. It's not very simple. Uh, so 
we specialize, so we take the same situation as before, and I specialize even more so that the, of this, so I assume this form. So, so he, it depends on the, so the equilibrium depends on the particle density in a really, uh, the uh, kinetic energy in a very simple way, just E to the minus energy. And then it depends, then it has this part here which is, which relates to the angular momentum, so to, so to speak. Um, so we assume that with some function gamma here, which is even function. And okay, so for the nonlinear stability, we are making even stronger assumption. But the first, the main assumption is this one. That means there's no growing mode. Now, from the fact that there's no growing mode, you cannot prove a nonlinear theorem uh, because you don't have you don't have any decay at all. It's just the linear things go like e to the i omega t, where omega is real. So it, they just oscillate. So you can never, I mean, I don't think you can ever prove nonlinear stability. So not, the proof of this doesn't actually depend on, the, on theorem one. Uh, but we make this assumption. <coughs> and uh, okay, then we prove that if you take initial data, everything is period P, which is close to the equilibrium in a sense that I'm not describing in this theorem. Um, close in some sense, some reasonable norm, then, then we, this is the conclusion. So the conclusion is for every epsilon and for all time in the future, it remains close. It remains epsilon close. The solution remains epsilon close to where you started. So here you see, here is the magnetic field of time t minus where you started, uh, minus the equilibrium. And it remains epsilon close. So we started by saying initially it, it's delta close to the equilibrium, and we have the uh, the orbital stability part in here, same here, and and this too. And these norms are are reasonable. These are reasonable norms to. I mean, the L2 norm that's energy, electromagnetic energy, and that's a reasonable norm to consider. Um, Okay, so that's the stability statement. Now I want to state one more theorem. So recently, recently my student Jonathan Bernacci was able to consider cases in which, which omit this assumption. So the assumption previously, remember, the assumption previously was that as a function of particle energy, there are fewer particles at larger energies. And, uh, and, right, and for example, in the last theorem that I just talked, it was e to the minus. It was exponential to the minus uh, the, the particle energy. And here, uh, here, so it definitely decreases. But here, we don't assume that. So the general feeling is that you should have instability. Well, this, this is sort of a, this monotonicity, in, the monotonicity that we had before, that this is less than zero, is usually, it's usually associated with stability. If you go back to the first theorem of Oliver Penrose in 1960, he has a, he shows for the simplest kind of equilibrium, he shows linear stability under a weaker condition than monotonicity. The monotonicity, okay, so so it's somehow associated, but it could, so if you believe our Oliver Penrose type of uh, theorem generalizes to much more general cases, then this, you certainly, you certainly could have non-monotonicity like this, uh, and you might have stability. Uh, okay, so you could have, so anyway, so he has shown that you have instability, linear instability, it's, it's, this is like theorem one, part of theorem one, uh, in, in this case. So he assumes this in particular, and the one and a half dimensional case, 
And now, now it, instead of, okay, so now the condition is for linear instability, this is a sufficient condition, is this. This is a funny, this is even somewhat more complicated. L naught is the same operator we had before. A1 naught is A, that's the same operator we had before. Uh, this is a scalar, it's given by this expression. It's, it's one of those one of those terms involving the projection. You have projection on the ions and electron part. Um, but um, the point is, so N, N represents, so here we have a self invariant operator. N means the number of negative eigenvalues. So only the finite number of negative eigenvalues, we know that uh, in this problem. And, um, um, and you just count how many negative eigenvalues there are. And here's the number of negative eigenvalues of that other operator. And here's, well, this is just a scalar, so this just means it's one. It's one if that's negative, and otherwise it's zero. Let's get over here. Uh, so he, he's been able to prove this theorem. And um, so let's go, if we go back to the case, so it's better, actually we don't really have to assume that, it's just uh, we want to include that, we want to generalize to allow for this condition. So you go to homogeneity. If you're in the monotone case, then if you look back at the definitions of those rather complicated operators, uh, A10 has no negative eigenvalues. So this is zero. This one is zero. And this one is one. This constant is one if you take that case. This is one. This is zero. Zero and one, one. So that means just that the number of negative eigenvalues of L0 is zero. There are no negative eigenvalues of L0, which means L0 is a non-negative operator. So that exactly reduces to the previous term. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll just have a few minutes. Maybe I'll just say a few words about um, proofs. Uh, let's see. What shall I? Okay. So. Okay. So. All right. So. The proof, okay, for linear stability, going back to theorem one. The proof is based, or maybe, okay, okay. The proof of stability, both in the linear and in the case, is based entirely on the invariance. You have exact invariance. Remember, there's no decay, but you have certain invariance. So this, this is not so easy to see. It's easier to see it for the nonlinear case. And when you linearize, we're back to the cylindrical symmetric case. Uh, then you, um, this is exactly an invariant. This is basically, this is the, uh, like the energy, but we've linearized around the equilibrium. So here you have the equilibrium here, uh, here, and you have half and a, a theta is the theta component of the linear problem here. So here we have the equilibrium. So you see, this is an L2 type norm. That's exactly an invariant. And so are these guys. These are also invariant. These are a couple of Casimirs. Okay. So these are invariants for every function g. And so you use that. You use that. And well, I have a sketch of a proof here, but I'm afraid maybe it's okay. You use that, and you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I is that first invariant over here, that big one here, the main energy, and one eventually shows an inequality, this inequality, after some non-trivial calculations. Uh, here's that projection again. These are the components in the other dot in the R, the Z direction, and so on and so forth. But notice that this term is positive, this term is positive, this term is positive. Lambda is real, I mentioned that before. <coughs> and so if L naught is a non-negative operator, then this is positive, it's positive. So, ah, so what have I done? I, I said assume we have a solution. Um, yeah, I said, yeah, I have to say that. 
we assume we have a growing mode, e to the lambda t, and then we get that, and then we get that inequality, this inequality, and then if this is non-negative operator, you, you get a contradiction. Uh, so uh, that's how the proof goes. And uh, I'll just say a few words about the other direction. Uh, to prove the linear instability. Uh, okay, so you look at the particles, how the particles move, and then you, okay, so then uh, you, we're going to integrate formally the, the Vlasov equation. Uh, so we talk about the linearized problem. Here's the linearized Vlasov equation. Here. This is what I, you see capital D is this operator that appears here. And, um, and when you solve this, you, you get this expression uh, because you have this, the lambda here, this is from here. And um, yeah, so when you, okay, you get that expression. So, all right, uh, let's see, maybe this is a little too complicated to do in just a couple of minutes. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, okay, we, we, um, one thing we use, I'll just point out a few things we use in the proof. We, we have the Coulomb gauge at the top line. And the Coulomb gauge is, in the Coulomb gauge, I define the, the magnetic potential capital A uh, so that its divergence is zero and that's equal to that top line. And there's, and there's no theta component because there's no theta, theta derivatives are all zero. So it looks like that. And therefore, we can, we just have two scalar functions, A, R, and A, Z. And we can write them in this way as, um, uh, in terms of one scalar function, pi, which we call pi. Um, okay, so now we have one scalar function, which we call pi. And then we reduce everything down using the, using uh, this operator here, uh, solving the linearized velocity equation to a pair of equations involving a theta and this pi, this so-called superpotential. Um, we're really using the fact that we're cylindrically symmetric. And then we do, so we get down to a matrix operator. <coughs> so we have this matrix operator, and then, yeah, so they, we have to solve, it. so in order to find a growing mode with exponent lambda, e, like e to the lambda t, it reduces to this equation. In other words, we want something in the kernel of this linear operator. Now, the operators are rather complicated, and I haven't even defined, I haven't defined three of these four components here, but of a similar type as before. <coughs> and in fact, I haven't defined any of them. Here are, here's the definition of, of L with a super lambda rather than a super zero. It's this, uh, this thing with this Q operator here. Okay, so it's rather complicated. But, um, uh, we then, we use Zhu Lin's continuation method to, we want to get a kernel for that matrix, right? So we're going to focus on a kernel of this operator. And to find a kernel, uh, Lin figured out that uh, uh, you can look it's a self-adjoint operator, and you can look at lambda equal zero and lambda equal infinity. We want to get a kernel, and we want to show, so the method is to show that the number of negative eigenvalues at lambda equal zero and at lambda equal infinity are different. And therefore, by continuity, and the fact that it's self-adjoint, uh, implies that there's some lambda in between where you have a kernel. You want a positive lambda where you have a kernel. And so um, the hard part is to look at lambda goes to zero. And so, 
So you look at what the limit is as lambda goes to zero. The limit is this operator. The formal limit as lambda goes to zero. And um, so you look at, you count, so basically you're counting the number of eigenvalues. Um, and so it's this counting method which shows you that you actually have a kernel for the operator m lambda and therefore you have a, um, and therefore you, you have a growing mode for, for the lambda that you find for the kernel. So there exists a lambda for which this has a kernel. And therefore, e to the lambda t will be, the growing mode will be like e to that lambda t. <coughs> okay, so I don't have time to talk about anything else, but I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna just end with just a list of rather obvious open problems. Uh, I didn't really talk about well poisonous, but a big problem in this subject is well poisonous in 3D so existent uniqueness in the same space. Or just regularity in without, without any axial symmetry. Axial symmetry. So I mean the expert on this subject is Bob Lassie in the back row, because he, he and Jack Schaefer were able to do the two and a half dimensional case. But it seems no one knows how to get rid of that symmetry. Okay. So that's a big open, a major open problem. Uh, and same thing, in full th three-dimensional without any cylindrical symmetry, these theorem, we, we absolutely use the symmetry here in what I've talked about today. So that's really open the question. Non-linear theorems, even, even forget about full 3D symmetry, even with, with cylindrical symmetry, we don't know how to do it. Uh, I gave you one explicit example at the very beginning, just to illustrate that we can actually figure everything out in some examples, but really there are very few explicit examples uh, where you can really verify, okay, here you have the situation, this is stable, this is unstable, very few cases like that. Uh, okay, and then I want to end with a favorite problem that I always mention. One-dimensional Lasso-Poisson case. So no magnetic field, just Lasso-Poisson. And now Penrose proved, so without that monotonicity condition that we talked about before, so you get a linear, Penrose proved in that 1960 paper, you got a linear uh, stability, even for some non-monotone cases. So when it, when it works like, <coughs> Yeah, when the, the non-monotone, so it could go like this, not monotone. Uh, it can, if it's very non-monotone, then it's unstable, according to Penrose, but otherwise it's linearly stable. Is it, is it non-linearly stable? Maybe it's non-linearly unstable. And nobody really knows how to handle this case. This is one-dimensional velocity plus so it's a much more reduced problem than the ones I've been talking about. So there are many, many open problems. It's an exciting area because I think I think many physicists are very interested in this. Astrophysicists and also nuclear physicists are very interested in this kind of question. Okay, so thank you very much.